What is up YouTube and welcome to another video of our Kubernetes beginners guide. In this video we're going to be taking a look at persistent volumes, what they are, how we can use a persistent volume to store data in Kubernetes. We're going to take a look at a real life example so remember to check out the links down below so you can follow along and without further ado let's go. So let's forget about pods, Kubernetes and containers for a second. What is state? State is normally just some form of data that an application needs in order to function. Now a container or a pod or an application is just a process. There are two types of processes that can run. We can have a stateless process and a stateful process. Stateless process is a process that does not rely on state or data in order to function. It does not store any state or data in memory or the file system and stateless process usually like microservices, can come and go as they please. We can destroy the process and recreate the process without impacting our users. A state full process relies on state in order to function. They store states in only two places. One is in memory and the other is on disk. Memory allows fast access to data and state and is usually used for caching. Applications like Redis, MongoDB, Postgres, MySQL and data stores rely on state in order to function and they store their state either in memory for fast access but for persistence they store it on disk on the file system that allows the database to come and go and restore its state from disk meaning it's heavily reliant on the state in order to function the file system is the only way for state to persist among reboots so when a process dies and gets recreated it reads its state back from the file system so what makes containers different to other processes? Because a container is just a process, when that process writes to the file system, like a database writing an RDF or an MDF or whatever sort of file to the file system, it just writes to the file system of the host operating system. Now, the difference between a container and a process is that a container usually has its own file system. When Docker creates a container, it creates a virtual file system and attaches it to that container. So unlike processes on a host that have access to the whole file system, containers have their own file system. So when a container gets destroyed and recreated, it loses the file system and the file system gets recreated again. So files are lost. Therefore, the container file system is not persisted during restarts. Let's take a look at Postgres as an example. So in this example, I'm just going to say docker run. I'm going to run a Postgres database. Then if I do docker ps, I can see the database and I can go into Postgres with the docker exec command. Once in, I can log into Postgres and I can create a pretty basic table. I then list the table and we can see we have a table in the database and then I type quit to quit out of the container. Now, if I say docker rm-f and I remove that container, we can go back and spin it up and see if we persist our data. So I say docker run again, create a new container and then I say docker exec to go back into that container. I run psql to log into the database and then I list out the database and notice that we don't have any tables now. That is because PostgreSQL has persisted our data onto the file system but the container file system is not persisted when the container gets destroyed and recreated. Hence, we have some data loss. So how do we persist data in containers? In containers, Docker has this thing called a volume. So we can create a, a volume in Docker to mount into the container to persist data on the host machine. Kubernetes has the same concept of persistent volume. So let's take a look at container persistence. So Docker makes this process quite simple by providing data persistence through a volume. So we're going to create a Docker volume and then mount that volume into the container. So you can see I, I say Docker volume create post that creates a volume in Docker called Postgres. Then I say Docker run and I mount with the dash V flag. I mount that volume into the container in this file path. So this is the path that Postgres will store data in. So if I go ahead and run that container, I can then say Docker exec and I can pass in the container ID. So let's go inside. Then I say psql and I log in to my Postgres database. I create an example table and we can see that table already exists 
lists inside of that volume. So if I say slash DT, I have a table listed inside of the volume. I can then proceed to quit out and exit out of the container. I can then go ahead and destroy that container and let's rerun the container again. And let's go back inside, log back into SQL and list out the tables. We can see the table is there. So the table is being persisted to the file system and the file system is being persisted through a volume. So every time the container restarts, the volume is reattached to the container. So we don't have any data loss. So how does Kubernetes do this? Well, Kubernetes has the same concept of volume, but it's called a persistent volume. Now the same principle applies to Kubernetes. So in this example, I'm going to say kubectl create namespace. I'm going to create a Postgres namespace. Then I'm going to apply in the Postgres namespace an example of a Postgres database with no persistent volume. This is going to deploy a container without any persistent storage whatsoever. So I, if I apply that, we can see we've created a Postgres stateful set. So then I can say kubectl get pods we can see our pod is up and running and ready. I can then say kubectl exec to go inside of that pod. I can log into Postgres and I can create the example table. I can then confirm the table is there by listing it out and I can quit to exit out of the container. Now our database is inside the pod, inside the container virtual file system. So what if I go ahead and destroy that pod? So I say kubectl Postgres namespace delete pod. Now we can see Kubernetes automatically recreated our pod. So if I go back in, and I log back into Postgres, I print out the tables, and we can see the tables have been lost. That's because the container, just like in Docker, has lost its file system when the pod got recreated. So before I run in and show you the details of a persistent volume, let's take a look at what that would look like with Postgres. So I'm going to create a namespace called Postgres. I'm then quickly going to create in the Postgres namespace, I'm just going to create all the resources. So I'm going to create a persistent volume. I'm going to create a claim to that volume. And then I'm going to create a Postgres database using that volume. So if I go ahead and apply that and then apply the claim, and then I create my Postgres database with a persistent volume. We can see our persistent volume has been created. Our claim has been bound to that persistent volume and we have a Postgres pod up and running. If I go into that pod and we log into SQL, we create a table, we can confirm the table is there and we quit out and exit out of the container. And then let's go ahead and delete that pod. So we can see if I do get pods, Kubernetes has gone and recreated our pod. Now under the hood, it's mounted that pod to the same persistent volume that has our database. So if I go back into the container saying kubectl exec and I log back into SQL and I list out the tables, we can see our table is still there. So it has gone and mounted to the same persistent volume and and our database has been persisted so we don't have any data loss. So I showcased a very basic example of a persistent volume. What is a persistent volume? We know that it's pretty much a similar thing to a Docker volume. A persistent volume in Kubernetes is just a piece of cluster storage. So if we take a look at my Docker development YouTube series guide in the Kubernetes folder, I have a persistent volume folder and I have a persistent volume YAML file. Now a persistent volume is very basic object. It has a name. You can apply some labels to it. You can apply the a capacity in this case. So I'm giving it one gigabytes of storage. I'm giving the permission to say I, I have read write access and I define a host path where I want the volume to be mounted to on the host operating system machine. Where persistent volumes becomes a little bit more complicated is the storage class. So if we take a look at that persistent volume YAML file, we can see that I refer to a storage class called host path. Now there's a number of different storage classes in Kubernetes. Storage classes are really important when it comes to persistent volumes because a storage class is basically the provisioner of the storage. Kubernetes needs to know how you're planning to provision that storage. A storage class can be used for Kubernetes to dynamically create the storage or your engineers can bring their own storage like NFS file shares and then use a storage class to bring that storage into Kubernetes as a persistent volume. Kubernetes needs to know how to interface with that storage and that's why a storage class is really important. Storage classes help Kubernetes interface with the storage as well as describe what the type of storage is. So in this example here, the storage class name is host path and host path is a specific type of 
of storage in Kubernetes. So if I go to the Kubernetes documentation and I go to storage classes, we, if we scroll down, we can see that there's a number of provisioners available as a storage class. So you can bring an Azure file share or you can bring an, bring an AWS Elastic Block Store. So different cloud providers have their own different storages that you can bring as a persisted volume. So you need to define, either define that storage class, but many clusters created in the cloud already have a storage class defined. So if you're running Kubernetes on Minikube, Docker for Mac or Windows, or you're using Kind or K3S, you can use a local type um, storage class to provision local storage. So local storage is just a very basic storage where we mount the host drive into our pod as a persisted volume. Now to get the storage classes that are available in your cluster, you say kubectl get storage class. And we can see I have a host path type of storage because I'm running Docker for Windows, there's automatically a host path storage class here for me so I can mount stuff on the local host machine into the container as a persistent volume. You need to make sure that you grab the storage storage class name and then put that inside the storage class name field here for your persistent volume in order to use it. To show you an example of an Azure AKS Kubernetes cluster, if I say kubectl get storage class, we can see we have Azure file, Azure premium file, Azure disk and manage disk premium. Um, here as storage classes that we can go and use to provision storage in the cloud. So that is the persistent volume. You can see we just have a name, we give a storage class, we provide some capacity for this host path that we want to mount. Um, that's going to give us the size of the volume we want to create. And then other thing to notice is that persistent volumes are not bound by namespaces, meaning your administrators or your platform engineers that create this persistent volume can create it for the cluster wide. So it's not allocated for a specific namespace. That means pods that are running on any namespace can use a persistent volume. So in this example, I'm just going to say kubectl create a namespace for my Postgres database. And then I'm going to say Kubernetes apply, and I'm going to apply this file. So if you're following along, look at the Kubernetes folder, persistent volume folder, and we're going to apply this persistent volume. That is how you deploy it. Now you've got to make sure, as I said before, that the storage class name exists in your cluster and then go ahead and apply that. And when we say kubectl get PV, we can see that our persistent volume has been created capacity of one gig and it's ready to be used. So now that we know what a storage class is and we know what a persistent volume is, how do we use that storage? So in Kubernetes, the first thing we did was created our storage class to describe the type of storage, how it's provisioned and how we're planning to interface with that storage. We then created a persistent volume to say we want one gigabyte of that type of storage volume. So we created and described that piece of storage as a persistent volume. Now how we use that storage in Kubernetes has this thing called a persistent volume claim. That is a way for us to claim or allocate pieces of that storage to different pods and services running in Kubernetes. So we could have four pods, each using 250 megabytes of the capacity of the persistent volume. Persistent volume claims are great. It's a great way for a developer to say, I want a piece of that storage without having to know how the storage is provisioned, without having to know the credentials and the security around the storage. All they do is say, I want a claim of that storage. This is how much I want. And Kubernetes will automatically go and mount a folder into that um, pod or container for the developer automatically. So persistent volume claim simply references the persistent volume to be used and indicates how much storage you want to use from that volume. So now as a developer of an application or a microservice, I can just describe in a persistent volume claim how much storage I want from that volume. So if we take a look at the Kubernetes folder, persistent volume, I have this persistent volume claim.yaml. And in here, we describe the persistent volume claim. We give it a name. We have to provide the storage class again for that volume that's going to be using. And then we just say that we're requesting some storage. So here I'm just saying I want 50 megabytes from that persistent volume. But then I say kubectl apply in the Postgres namespace, I apply the persistent volume claim. Now, unlike persistent volumes, persistent volume claims are namespace bound. That is cool thing because a developer um, that has access to his own namespace can have access to his own claim. So he can be in control of what storage and how much storage he wants to have access to of a persistent volume. So to see that storage, we can say kubectl dash n for the Postgres namespace. I can say get pvc and that'll bring back the persistent volume claims. We can see that it's 
it's been bound to the example volume, which has a one gig capacity. So now that we have our persistent volume claim that has taken a chunk of that storage, how do we use it inside of our pod? Well, I have a couple of examples here. So the first example I said, I had a Postgres database with no volume. What we're going to want to look at is a Postgres database with volume. So if we take a look here, we have a basic config map. This is just a config um, describing our username and password to access the Postgres database. And then we have a stateful set. Now, normally in Kubernetes, when we use persistent volumes, we generally want to use a stateful set. This is because using a persistent volume can sometimes be very tricky with stateful workloads like databases and memory caches and message queues. Because remember, these applications have their own complicated clustering mechanism. That's why I created a video for Kubernetes stateful sets that I want you to have a look at. Stateful sets are designed for applications that require state like databases, and they help us to give our application and identity as well as a network identity with a DNS so that these applications can actually talk to one another and form a cluster. So take a look at the link down below for my video on how to use stateful sets. So in this example here, we have a stateful set um, named Postgres. We expose it via a service and then we have our container spec here. This is exactly the same, um, pretty much exactly the same as a deployment in Kubernetes. So we have this um, pod spec with a container. So I say I want to run Postgres 10 of four. I want to expose it over a port. Um, I want to mount that config in for Postgres. And this is the important part. So the first thing for a container, we need to create a volume mount. So we create a volume mount for this container spec called data to mount it into this path. This is the path that Postgres expects data to be written to. Once we created our volume mount, the volume mount refers to a name data. It actually refers to a volume name. So outside of the container spec, we see I have a volumes definition and I have a name of the volume. The name can be pretty much anything you could to describe the volume. It doesn't have to map to the persistent volume name. It can be any name. I'm just calling it data. But the important part is the reference inside of the volume to the persistent volume claim. So we say exactly what claim this pod should be using. And you can see if you look down here, we have example claim that we've already bound to the volume. So we're going to refer to that claim over here. And then finally, we just use a service to expose our pod. So then finally, to deploy this stateful set, I just say kubectl in the Postgres namespace apply dash F and I apply the Postgres with persistent volume dot YAML. That's going to go ahead and create the config map, the stateful set and expose it via a service. We can then confirm that our Postgres database is ready and up um, by doing kubectl get pods. So it's important to understand that there are many different types of persistent volumes. So in this example, we try to keep it basic, short and sweet by just going through the basic host path type example of a persistent volume. So we persist our data on the host. Now this might not be a good solution for a business critical system like a production database because remember Kubernetes can schedule pods on different nodes in Kubernetes meaning that if our pod in this example had to start up on another machine the data wouldn't be available on that machine. I go into this problem at much more granular detail in my stateful set video which I've linked down below. I want you to go and have a look at that video. In that video we go into great detail about what stateful and stateless workloads are and how stateful set helps us to manage storage across an entire cluster. So hopefully this video helped you understand what a storage class is, what a persistent volume is, and also how to use a persistent volume with a persistent volume claim. So I hope this video was useful. As always, like and subscribe. Let me know down in the comments what sort of videos you'd like me to cover in the future. And until next time, peace.